So, uh, hello everyone. Okay, the microphone works. That's good. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Talia, thanks uh, for being here. Um, I, we'll start our discussion by talking a bit about things that are happening right now on the ground in Israel, whether it's with regard to the settlement uh, movement, uh, things that are happening inside Israel in the democratic and legal aspects. Um, and at the end, we'll talk a bit about what the fund is doing these days and all kinds of projects that are taking place. And we will have time to open it up for questions. And I hope, I assume there will be many of those. Um, so let me start right off by asking you, Talia, a question that has to do with things that are happening today, but draws a bit on your experience when you were working as a legal advisor to the government in the days of Ariel Sharon. And at the time, you prepared a very famous, in Israel at least, very famous report about the legal outposts in the West Bank uh, and the expansion of the settlement movement. So this week, we had Jared Kushner uh, visiting Israel, trying to get peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And as he, as he arrived, there were two interesting and contradicting uh, statements being made in the Israeli media. On the one hand, we saw Prime Minister Netanyahu write on his own Facebook page that his government, the current government, is the best government ever for settlements in the West Bank, in the history of Israel. I agree. And, and at the same time, and at the same time, we were hearing uh, leaders of the settlement movement all over the place complaining that there is no building in the settlement, that, that uh, Netanyahu is freezing the building de facto, some of them even calling to replace him to take down his government and bring up a, a real right-wing leader. So we're hearing on the one hand, the best government ever for settlements. On the other hand, a freeze and no building. What's going on here? <laughs> well, every one of them is uh, trying to promote its agenda. Let's assume that you are a settler and Jared Kushner is coming to Israel to talk about a deal, which means no settlements, right? What would you like to present to him? How come? There is no settlement. We demand we want more, right? On one hand. So this is for two reasons. One, to, to explain to this Kushner that uh, our demand is to continue the settlement enterprise and don't think of getting any peace agreement. You could, of course, make any peace agreement you want, but the area remains ours. On the other hand, Netanyahu could show Trump that what kind of people he has in his coalition that if there would be some pressure on the Israeli government, then the coalition would collapse. So he needs to give them something. What can he give them uh, for, the, for the purpose to shut them down? More settlements. So now he declared that he is going to uh, establish a new settlement in the West Bank, something that the government of Israel tried not to do let's say, not always succeeded, uh, but uh, they are trying not to, uh, as, to approve new settlements in the West Bank. So now is the right time to do that. He promised the settlers. Without having pressure on him, how can he get Trump to approve this new settlement? So, he, so they are doing their role, he is doing his role, and as long as there are more settlements, everything is settled. So what you're saying is that this is some sort of internal political theater? The whole thing is internal political theater. There is no uh, um, uh, foreign affairs policy. There isn't such a thing. That the whole thing is not, I don't think that there is somebody that I am sorry to disappoint you. I don't believe that there is somebody that is thinking what is the good for the interest of the state of Israel. 
The question is what is good for the survival of this government. This is the question, that's it. And this is the answer. Now, when you were working on that report at the time for Prime Minister Sharon about the illegal outposts, yeah. about what's happening in the settlements, yeah. you look back at your work back then and you compare it to the situation that we have today, 2017, in the West Bank. Yeah. What has changed? Not a lot. Uh, the only thing that was changed, I, I thought in the beginning that nothing was changed. And then I was corrected that it's not true. They didn't continue the, the phenomena of new outposts. After the report was published, they didn't continue the phenomena of building new outposts. I have to admit, yes, it didn't happen. But they didn't stop the building in the West Bank. So they continue to build where the outposts were. And they are trying to turn, you know, the outposts are an illegal, settlement under internal law of Israel. Because if you're looking at the whole phenomena by the international law, so the majority of the world believes, including the United States, that it is illegal whatever it is. Every settlement, every outpost. But under Israeli law, the outposts are illegal under the internal law of Israel. So they're trying to turn those outposts into a so-called legal under internal law of Israel. They can do a part of it, and a part of it they can't do. So what, did, what they now they did lately, a few months ago, the expropriation law, I don't know how you call that, the expropriation. The law that basically is making the outposts legal, you know. So-called legal, yes, so yeah. the main problem that they have, that why they couldn't make it legalize, those outposts, because many of them were located on private Palestinian land. Now, they legislate a law that private Palestinian land is ours too. That's all. Now, everything, you could legalize everything. Everything. And that's when the Supreme Court intervened. We don't know yet. There is an appeal. I don't know what will happen with that. I, I can't imagine that uh, they will approve this law, but you know, I couldn't imagine many things. <laughs> and you know, we don't know yet what the new administration here in Washington really wants to do on the peace process and the settlements. <laughs> uh, you know, we are hearing all kinds of conflicting reports and intentions, and uh, Kushner is going back and forth and Greenblatt, but. From your experience, if there's one advice that you would give them on the issue of settlements and how to deal with this specific issue, what would it be? Well, if they were looking for my advice. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, maybe the White House is watching us right now. <laughs> <laughs> that might be. <laughs> I trust them, they are. <laughs> um, well, what I would recommend them Look, I think that it's extremely important for the world to understand, not only Jewish communities, everybody, Israelis and others. I'm an Israeli patriotic. I love my state exactly after my family. But to be a patriot of the state of Israel, you can't put into that definition the, the power to negate from Palestinians their right for a state of their own. Now, I want to tell you something. Ben-Gurion, he was an Israeli patriotic. He loved the state of Israel. He worked for the state of Israel. Nobody doubts that. What he decided on, on uh, 48, he decided about the partition plan that the United Nations approved, 181 resolution of the United, of the, uh, United Nations. Uh, this resolution, although I'm not saying that the borders that this resolution uh, uh, accepted, those are the borders of the state of Israel. Nobody is talking about that. We, all the world is talking about the 67 borders. But the idea of partition this is the principle, the idea of partition. You can't have it all. I think every one of you, an adult, 
knows and understands you can't have it all. Everything you want, you have it. You can't. This is not the world. Now, there is a place, there is a land, there is people that are living there for, for decades and decades and decades. The land it wasn't empty when we Israelis, the, the Jewish people decided to build our state there. And we were right. And we had the right. And this right was recognized by the United Nations. But what right was recognized? The right to have a part of the place, not all of it. Because if you take it all, then the other people don't have it. So you are relying upon the idea that they started a war, then you occupied the whole area, then it's ours. And of course, God gave it to us, so there is no debate about that. So it's ours. It's not ours. And you can't take the rights of a people to have their uh, a basic right for self-determination. You can take it from them. Look, uh, you know what the Germans did in, in uh, the Second World War. Can you remind me of uh, some people who did something worse than this? Did someone said ever that they lost their right for self-determination for the Germans people? So what are we talking about? And this is from the Palestinian point of view. And what about us? For us, it's a disaster. We want for us a disaster, not less. We're losing the state. We're losing because our state was based on democracy, on the two main principles, the homeland of the Jewish people and a democratic state. If we lose democracy, we lose the legitimacy of the world, of the homeland of the Jewish state. We have to understand that. And the only way that we could remain a respectful state in the world is to have a part of the land, not all of it. That's it. That's the whole story. And, and when <laughs> And when you talk about, and this is the last question I ask about this part of our debate because we have many other issues to talk about, but when you talk about the issue of self-determination, so Netanyahu comes and says, well, the Palestinians need to accept our self-determination as well, you know, accept Israel as a Jewish state. This is okay. his the condition. So okay. what is your answer to that? I agree to that, but not as a precondition, as the last condition of the negotiation. Look, I'm talking with Palestinians and there, I don't know if you've heard of uh, the Geneva Accord, uh, maybe part of you knows about that. In 2003, uh, there's an Israeli and Palestinian launched an uh, in, uh, uh, alternative peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. And all the core issues were covered. All of it was written. Every negotiation, formal negotiation, after 2003 was based on this, and this was based on the Clinton parameters. So how the, the agreement is going to be looked like, everybody knows. We know, and Netanyahu knows, exactly. Now, if he puts a precondition of recognize the state of Israel as a Jewish state, what does it mean? What a Jewish state? What is it? Is it a religious state? What about the Arabs? 20% of Israelis, 1.8 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. What is this Jewishness to do with them? Is this a religious state of the Jewish people? It's non, not theirs. This is what the right-wing uh, people want now to legislate the law about the nation state. This state belongs only to us Jews. What about them? What does it mean to be a citizen of this state, of this, the only democracy in the Middle East? Being a, a democracy, a type of a Middle East, not a democracy. Well, so we could go on probably to talk about the core issues of the conflict for hours, uh, but there are, you know, and I think 
I'll bet that, you know, if we'll have this discussion another year, we could still bring them on, unless Jared Kushner pulls off the most amazing <laughs> peace <laughs> agreement ever. But I do want to ask you about other things as well, because while we are debating these questions, some would say the endless uh, pursuit of the agreement, a lot of things are also happening inside Israel that uh, I'm sure you have a lot to say about. And uh, I'll start by asking you about the, the breaking news of today, of this morning in Israel, uh, when we heard that uh, the spokesperson for Breaking the Silence, an organization of uh, former IDF soldiers and officers who are testifying against the, the occupation, has been um, asked by the police to, to come for questioning because he basically testified about uh, uh, using a very harsh violence against an innocent Palestinian. How do you view this uh, development from today? Well, what to say? First of all, the whole idea that that person admitted that this is what he did and therefore he is a part of this organization and he approaches to the government of Israel to stop the occupation because it's not a he is not the one who did it. It's a phenomena that he was uh, ready to admit that he was a part of it, but everybody is doing that. Now, they caught him and want to charge him, and who wants to charge him? The minister of uh, the uh, Ministry of Justice. She wrote a letter to the Attorney General and said, you have to find if it's true, and if it's true, you have to charge him. So there's so many things to say about that. I don't know where to start with. First of all, I don't know. How come that a minister is involving with an investigation? This is something I can't accept. Once when I was a prosecutor, you know that I was one of the senior prosecutors in Israel. I even was uh, the head of uh, the investigation against the first criminal case against Netanyahu. Uh, but they, they, did, they didn't accept my uh, opinion. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, uh, I got once a telephone call from one of the ministers that used to be, not now anymore, and uh, he wanted me to do something about some investigation. I said to him, I don't understand. First, how come that you know my telephone, my cell phone? Second, why, if you know my number, how come that you are calling me? Third, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't talk with you about any investigation. You are not my boss. I owe you nothing. You are a minister in the government, and I'm very sorry I can't talk with you about that even. Right? So this is what I'm thinking, really. Not, not to be so brave. I think this is what should be done. How come that that minister wrote to the Attorney General what to do in a specific case? I can't get it. This is one thing, but this is not the worst. Your story, a bit of a James Comey story right there, someone <laughs> said. <laughs> but then, you know, as to the, as the aspect of, you know, the event itself, and because yeah. a, lo a lot of yeah. the critics of breaking the silence yeah. and of NIF will come and say, well, look, you know, this is, you guys are supposed to be against violence, so how come, you know, Yeah, yeah, she's happening? waiting for us to say that, exactly. But what I would say, first of all, where were you until today? So it's uh, a matter of few years. Why did you wake up today? What happened that you started the investigation? But uh, this is not the issue. The issue is that you have to ask yourself, if that minister, her aim is to bring more justice and forcing off the law, would it be the result of her interference now or not? Because if you're going to charge that person, and you're going to send him to jail, do you think that there will be a second one who will declare about phenomena of uh, hitting Palestinians after him or not? So the, the whole thing is to bring people to shut their mouth and not to speak about what they see because she wants the occupation to continue and continue and she knows exactly what is the price and she wants us to pay the price, that's it. She doesn't mind as long as we hold the area. 
So basically your concern is that if someone is being, you know, put on trial for testifying about things they did during the military service, no people will be willing to testify in the future? I, look, I am sure that uh, this president won't bring more people to give uh, testimonies about what happened. He is an, uh, that, that guy, he's an ideological warrior. He wants to put it on the public sphere. He's the kind of person who would pay the price. Please. He's ready to pay the price, I'm sure. But uh, you know that this organization is uh, attacked daily by the government. Our organization is attacked by Bibi Netanyahu, I think, the last month, four times. What, what, what Especially against NIF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I, I, he usually likes to, to to, um, to do something interesting, which is to link you guys with Naftali Bennett. Whenever Naftali Bennett, who is the Minister of Education and who is to the right of Netanyahu, uh, uh, attacks Netanyahu over something, not being enough right wing, Netanyahu has this kind of, it's, it's like a copy-paste kind of uh, thing that, you know, Bennett did something with NIF. I don't remember what it was, it's, uh, you know. Oh, the last time that uh, I was involved with it was uh, a week ago in the Arid conference. You know that Bennett, uh, he boycott uh, the Arad conference in last years. He said he is not ready to come to talk when NIF is one of the sponsors of the conference. This year he accepted. And I said that when a politician does something good, you have to say that publicly. So I said it's very good that Bennett accepted to uh, give his speech in a conference when NIF supported. He wasn't very happy, but we were. <laughs> it wasn't the blessing he was looking for. Maybe he wanted yeah. you guys to attack Aretz for inviting him. But, you know, so, but to go back to the subject, how, I mean, these, do you see an escalation in these kinds of attacks on organizations like NIF, like Breaking sure. the Silence, and well, why? This is something that I could uh, try to explain. Um, I think that uh, in Israel we have a delegitimization of the left for many years since the Rabin assassination and before that. Uh, I think that uh, people are afraid to declare we belong to the left. Uh, I think that uh, one of the tools that Bibi Netanyahu use is how to create an enemy. Those people, they are bad people. They are against the state. They are traitors. They are not patriotic of the state of Israel. Uh, and uh, this is the way he does to human rights organizations since they are the only ones who remained to fight for our uh, goals as democracy. You know that democracy became a matter in a debate. You, you believe in democracy, I believe so, but not all of the Israelis are believing in democracy because this right-wing uh, government tries to persuade the people that there is contradiction between Jewishness and democracy. What is the problem with democracy? We lived with democracy a few years, nothing happened bad to us. So why it became so risky for us, this democracy? Because democracy is based on equality. And equality, it means equal rights to Jews and Arabs. Oh, this we don't like. Arabs equal to Jews? No, no, no. Those who are ready to accept the Arabs as equal to us, they love the Arabs. If you love the Arab, you hate the Jews. So there is a contradiction between being a democratic state and a Jewish state. And therefore, when there is a contradiction between those two things, Jewishness and democracy, then we are for Jewishness. So there is a, 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 a wind coming from the government against specific populations. And we are as an organization that demanding democracy demanding equality, demanding integration of Palestinian citizens of Israel with Israelis, and demanding basic rights to everyone, then 
We became the enemy. That's it. Now, I'll ask you a question that has to do with the internal Israeli politics on the left, because some people on the, on the left, like, you know, you would say even like the leader of the opposition, Herzog, their calculation in response to what you describe as delegitimization uh, of the left is to come and say, we're going to take some distance from organizations like NIF. We're going to call you out. We're going to say that you are the ones hurting the left. You are the ones taking it too far to the extreme. What is your response to that kind of internal debate? What is the extreme? Being a democratic, this is being on the extreme. So what is the mainstream? I really don't know. I don't understand that. I don't think I am one on the extreme. I think I am the mainstream of Israel. I hope. But for, for the right wing people, it's good to put us under a, a definition of the bad guys. It, it's good for them. They think that it encourages their base when you have an enemy. Someone to point Hertog, at. Hertog. What to you, say you about say Hertog? It. You can <laughs> say <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yourself. He's, he's, I he's, don't know. He's running no. for re-election in the labor primaries in 12 days. I, didn't, I don't see his successes. And uh, I can't support this way of behavior. Uh, look. Maybe because I'm not a politician exactly, I'm an ideological person, and I believe in, uh, in principles. Uh, I can't leave my principles for other goals. So I believe in democracy, and I'm ready to fight for it. And I think that the one who uh, abandoned those uh, principles, maybe he didn't abandon, but he didn't want to put them on the table, uh, publicly and openly, I, I don't think, you know, I think that it's even from a political point of view, it's a mistake. Why? I think that people understand that. What, that there's something, be, like there's something being concealed, something Look, not being truthful? there is a debate in Israel. You can't hide it. You can't hide it. There is a debate. There is one way that people are thinking, and this is a different way than people are, are thinking. You have it in the States. You know that. So you can't hide yourself and pretend as if you belong to them when you are belong to them. They know it, and they know it where you belong to. And anyhow, even if you could uh, really hide, I, I don't like it. I can't accept it as, as a strategy. As a, as way a strategy, to do yes, and I think it's not working. But anyhow, if it's working or if it doesn't work, I'm not there. And this is kind of, uh, I think, in a way, you know, re reminds people of the debates that are happening in the United States now among the opposition, or maybe I should call it the resistance, <laughs> you know, all kinds of terms. And I do want to ask you before we talk a bit about different things that the NIF is doing these days in Israel. If you have felt any effect in Israel from the events that have been happening here for the last half year, yeah. the rise of President Trump, specifically on the issue we discussed in the last few minutes of you know, civil yes. society and organizations, where do you see it? Well, uh, this is a very important question. Um, look, uh, President Obama uh, was a, a human rights defender. This is from my point of view. This is what I have seen. And when the government of Israel started to, with this uh, kind of legislation, what we call the anti-democratic legislation, he interfered from time to time. So many times it was quiet. You know, not, uh, you, you couldn't uh, read the headlines in the, in the news about that. But there was some, sometimes that it was, uh, he went public with it. For instance, about the law of the NGOs that uh, Bibi Netanyahu legislated a, a, a softer law in the end of the day that you know that some organization has to put a badge on their clothes when they are coming to the Knesset or wherever and to uh, 
s declare about themselves that they are uh, um, foreign agents of uh, some foreign entities or states. Um, when he decided, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, to, to legislate this law, uh, Samantha Powers came to Israel. I met with her and uh, some other organizations met with her with uh, Dan Shapiro. And she wanted to listen to us, the civil society, to hear what we have to say about this legislation. And she went uh, the day after to uh, speak with uh, Bibi Netanyahu. I don't know what she spoke with him, but I know what Dan, uh, Dan Shapiro said publicly in, uh, in the radio about uh, this law and he said that in the United States it couldn't uh, pass this law and they had a huge argue, argue with them if it yeah. could pass or not or whatever. So we had on that time when Obama was in a, a president, we had some policemen that was in the area. This policeman vanished. Now who we have to defend our human rights, Trump? Well, we, you know, it was interesting that we saw the German government last week kind of intensifying their position on the issue of the NGOs uh, in Israel in light of the new legislation that Netanyahu says he wants to propose that any foreign funding will be forbidden. So uh, the German foreign ministry put out a statement saying that this is like China and Russia. Yes, well, I support them with what they're doing. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the visit of uh, the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Germany visiting in Israel, uh, meeting with uh, some human rights organizations that Bibi Netanyahu uh, prohibited him to meet with. And he said, if you're going to meet with him, I'm going to uh, cancel the meeting with you. And he did it. I was in that meeting. And I met with the Minister for Foreign Affairs of uh, Germany. And I appreciate very much what he did. I think it was a real backing for uh, some organizations in Israel that are being, I don't know how to call that, that the government delegitimized those people as sometimes I'm afraid, you know, that before Abin was assassinated, people called him traitor. Called him traitor, called him traitor, and one day someone came with a gun and, and killed him. So why not to do that to those horrible people from breaking the silence or pretending? Who's going to be responsible for that? You know, the uh, deputy for uh, uh, Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Hotobeli, she said about breaking the silence uh, a month ago, she said, this is the enemy of the inside. I don't know if I used the right word. Like the internal enemy. No, internal enemy from the inside. Uh, you know that the Nazis used to call that Jews in Germany. And the Nazis. Uh, and uh, the speaker of the Knesset, he said in the uh, Independence Day from Har Herzl, you know, he's. His speech is something that used to be uniting the whole populations in Israel. You know what he said? He said about the left, not all of them are traitors. Thank you very much. Now, you know, you have become very affiliated with these kinds of organizations and with the, the work that NIF is doing on, you know, the, I would say the toughest issues in the Israeli debate. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about, you know, in the general outlook, what the fund is working on these days, you know, with this issue in mind and, and others as well? You know that uh, NIF, New Israel Fund, uh, that uh, was founded approximately 40 years ago, more or less, uh, at the beginning, I think I wasn't there, of course, uh, they thought how to build a civil society and uh, they, they dealt a lot with uh, social justice uh, and saw themselves as the whole uh, activity of theirs is to promote civil society in Israel. A strong civil society, it means a strong democracy. In the last years, 
not, you know, not uh, two years or three, the last year, six, seven years, uh, we're mainly dealing with democracy. We're seeing that we have to defend democracy in Israel. And it's more important than everything. So we used to, to take care, and we're doing that. Also today, taking care of whatever you want, women, gender, uh, the gays, uh, how you call the that? LGBT community. LGBT, yeah. Uh, refugees, uh, people in the periphery, poor people, uh, public housing in Israel, uh, integration between Jews and Arabs, uh, whatever, wherever you look. But our main force today is how to protect democracy in Israel, and we are dealing with this every day, and therefore we're so severely attacked. This is the reason. And I have one more question before we open it up for uh, the uh, questions from the crowd. You know, one thing that I've heard is, as a kind of criticism is people say, well, you know, NIF is doing all these wonderful things, like you said, in public housing and with the LGBT community. Why don't you guys focus on that and, you know, cut ties to any kinds of uh, controversial organizations, people, you know, like stuff that is more, you know, has to do with the occupation. W what do you say about that? Well, if we wanted to gain popularity, for sure we had to do that. But we are not there at all. As you see, we are ideological, stupid people. <laughs> we believe in principles. So uh, I think uh, this is one of the most important things for us to do. Uh, I think that uh, to stop the occupation, to bring Israel to a separation between Israel and Palestinian people, to, to, to focus on Israel's democracy and defend it. These are the most important thing that should be done in Israel. Therefore, I'm there. You know, I'm a volunteer. I could go from here and forget about NIF. But I, I'm doing that because I believe that this is the most important thing to do as an, a city, an uh, Israeli citizen patriotic of the state of Israel that is seeing that our state, we're going to do this. And we can't allow ourselves. This is what I think. A anyhow, I can't. Uh, if I will do that, then what about my family that came 100 years ago to, to this land of Israel to build a kibbutz, to build a state for the Jewish people? All of them are dead already. What about their enterprise? What about a Zionist enterprise? Is that something that you just could turn your back to and deal with yourself? Not me. Well, on that, I don't know, optimistic or pessimistic note. <laughs> we will now open it up for q and I just want to emphasize, please ask questions, do not uh, um, answer the que answer the answers by yourself. All right, specific, <laughs> focused, and Thank short you. questions, please. And we have a lady in the back. Yes. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, I feel the need to say that. What percentage of the Israeli citizenship feels the same way as you do? Because it is extremely dispiriting watching this from here, watching what's happening, and having the same reactions. Um, also worrying about our own country, but worrying about Israel. Thank you. To answer or what? You, you, you want to take a few and then... Collecting few questions? Uh, if you can remember that, then yes. So we have another one in the back over there. Yeah. Oh, answer first, that's what we do? Okay, so, okay. Well, uh, I would say that uh, it's very difficult to really to know how many Israelis holding my positions. A uh, minority holds my positions publicly. Many of them are afraid. If you're going to ask somebody, somebody in the street, what is your view? What, how would you define yourself? So some of them would say, I'm on the right. And some would say, I'm in the center. But very little people, very little amount of people would say, I am a lefty. People don't want to be on the left, and they're right. There is a delegitimization of, 
of people on the left. And why should they? But I believe that if we'll have uh, the right leader, I think you would be astonished to see what will come out of Israel. I think that many Israelis feel that something is wrong here. Many Israelis. They even don't know exactly what. Yeah, we had a question over there in the back. And, uh. Hi, my name is Netra Halpern with Peace Films, and I really appreciate everything you say, especially defending Breaking the Silence, because I think they're awesome. I was uh, surprised the very last thing you said. You said uh, defending my home, my family, all that enterprise, and then you said Zionism, because often the same people that believe what you say do not think Zionism is a good thing. So. Well, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, it was wrong for me to say that here, since I know that in America, when you say Zionist, people think, oh, she supports the settlement. No, so I don't support the settlements. Uh, I, th I believe in the old way of Zionism, as it was declared in the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. Uh, the State of Israel was founded on two main principles, being the homeland of the Jewish people, be open to every Jew in the world that want to come to Israel, make Aliyah, and be a citizen of Israel. I am for it. I am for Israel as a democratic state. I am not ready to accept Israel as a non-democratic state. These are the principles that I believe in. For, to that, I call being a Zionist. This is the Zionist movement, that this is the creation of independence that, that came out of them. This was the beginning of the state of Israel, and these are the principles that the state was built on. Okay, now, I know that today there are people who said, oh, creating the, the settlement uh, enterprise, this is Zionism, this is post-Zionism, this is bringing us to a dead end. This is the end of the Zionist movement. Gentleman in the back, yeah. Yes, thank you. My name is James Warren. I'm not affiliated with anybody, so that gives me a certain freedom to say things others might not. I'm wondering what you would like from us in the United States. I wholeheartedly agree with almost everything that you've said here, but it's not a view and a, and a set of opinions that's widely held over here or is really allowed to be discussed in many forums. You can say it here at the Middle East Institute in front of 100 people, but people do not get on television get the chance to say the things that you are saying in this country. Nobody in Congress talks the language that you are talking. It is extremely difficult, and anybody who tries to say these things faces a wall of opposition from Israel's supporters here. The mainstream Jewish establishment and the Jewish organizations are very hostile to anyone who says the sort of things that you say, and they're not slow to call people anti-Semitic if they do it. So what would you like us to do to help you? Thank you for the question. I know it's difficult. And it's a phenomenon all over the world in Jewish communities that I meet wherever you want. The same phenomena. And the same phenomena in Israel. Uh, I think that, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to give you an example from the German uh, government. But what they did just now was extremely important for us Israelis. Because people who love the state of Israel, and this is my love, don't question that. I think we should say the right thing to protect the state. When the policy of the government is totally wrong. Now, I know that you're I assume a Jewish person who, no, 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 Christian. a Christian, or whatever you are, sitting here in the States, and I, I know that it's difficult for you to come and say, well, I believe Israelis should do this and that, but I'm not a part of them. So people would say, well, you're not there, so how come that you have a say about what's happening there? I think that when we, that today we arrive to a place that it's so threatening of the existence of the State of Israel 
that everyone who loves the state should speak up because we're losing this state. We're losing it. And therefore, you could say, look, I'm not saying that Israel should uh, take part in uh, some war, yes or no. Of course, I'm not a citizen. I'm not there. But, but being a uh, democracy, this is the resolution of 181, of form 48. This is the principle that the state was built on. This is what this state declares about itself since the minute that it was founded until this day. The only democracy in the Middle East. So what are we talking about? Democracy? How come that they're going to legislate a law to, to uh, stop funding of uh, NGOs that are thinking differently from the policy of the government not to be funded by uh, foreign countries? Why? This is, we know what kind of state does that. So why can't we speak up? Even here, why not? Why the German government can do that and people here can't do? And, and not to speak about the uh, Jewish people, that Israel declares that we are the homeland of the Jewish people, we're a Jewish state, so what about us? Can't we say that we are going to lose the state if we'll do this and that and that? That the state of Israel said that we are a part of it. And when we are talking about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, it's not an internal issue of Israel. This is an international conflict. Thank you. Over here, yes. The great American philosopher Yogi Berra said it's difficult to predict, especially about the future. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I'll ask you, if you were to, to give this talk here five years from now, do you think you'll be saying the same things, or will, will there, will, do you think there may be a substantive change? I am afraid to give you an answer. <laughs> uh, um. Not because uh, I don't dare to predict the future, which I am down there to predict the future, but because I dare to predict the future this time. And I'm very much afraid what might happen in five years from now. I don't know. I hope we could sit the same as we do now, but I'm not sure. Uh, there was, yeah, right over there, question. Uh, here in the, in the lane, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask a question about the status of Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Um, Netanyahu recently made a very controversial statement, which was he said Palestinians want ethnic cleansing in the West Bank as a prerequisite for peace. And I thought that many people thought that this statement was extreme, um, but uh, it did raise a question for some people about what should happen to the Israeli settlers who are currently in the West Bank in the future. Could they be part of a future Palestinian state, or uh, should that entire situation sort of be uh, re-examined? And I was just curious to uh, sort of hear your thoughts about that. Um, look, I think that uh, to leave settlers in the West Bank under Palestinian authority, it's a huge mistake, a huge one. And I think that Netanyahu understands that. This is what I believe. He never said that. But just imagine that there is a peace agreement between Israel and Palestine. Israel is removing the IDF back to Israel. Settlers are remaining where they are. And we are fine one night. The day after, maybe an extremist Palestinians might go to some settlement, there's no IDF anymore, and might kill the whole nursery. 20 kids, dead, slaughter. What will happen? 24 hours after that, the IDF is back in the area. Or what would happen if extremist Israelis would do the same thing to Palestinians? And both of the extremists 
would like to blow up the agreement. Both of them. They want, don't want to have the agreement. Every one of them, because they want the whole, the whole land for themselves. And therefore, you can't leave it to those people. It's craziness. And therefore, you have to bring the people back. Why Ariel Sharon left the people in Gaza Strip under a Palestinian authority? He ruined all the houses of 8,000 people and brought them back to Israel. You can't leave your people there. It's not, you know, maybe you're thinking of uh, an agreement between two states in Europe, whatever, between the United States and, and Canada. It's not that. It, it, we're not there. Even there would be a peace agreement. It would take decades until a real relationship would be applied in the area. Wait, a lady over there in the back. Um, in the United States, we've realized that, we have, that we've lost the political voice of the people by not um, taking care of running candidates on a local level and all the way up. Is there, um, is there a, a, an initiative in Israel? Is there a, anybody who's trying to get young people to run for office, to get involved in po politics? I've always felt that many of your best minds have left and that it's le that that the people that are running for office getting involved in the political world of Israel are 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 missing from a centrist or left or democratic point of view uh, there is an attempt by NGO uh, to prepare people for leadership we <clears throat> We give money for that, we fund it, in, in a way. Uh, but if, it might succeed, but if you ask me about leadership, it's something that a person, maybe he doesn't know that yet, but it's something that a person is born with and will have the drive because he believes that things should be changed and come out of the people. This is what I think. But uh, maybe we could help by preparing people for leadership, but we're doing that. Uh, over here in the front. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my question concerns the recent book by uh, Nathan Thrall, uh, The Only Thing They Understand which I have not yet read, but I saw uh, an op-ed synopsis that he wrote, I believe in the June 3rd New York Times. And I've also noticed that uh, if you look for it on Amazon, it gets either a five or a one. <laughs> um, are either of you, uh, have either of you read it and would you care to comment on it? I did. Let's say, I mean, let's uh, move on to questions to Talia. I think it's, it's a really fascinating book, but that's a wholly different discussion, uh, so I apologize. But we have a question over here. Yes, um, in terms of internal relations between Jews and Arabs, there has been initiatives by the Israeli government, I think it's 922, um, which involves e equalizing spending between Arab towns and increasing um, education quality and things like that, um, it, which seems in contrast to some of the other s things you spoke about. And I would be curious to hear your comments and thoughts about that. Well, uh, there was a plan that was approved by the government of Israel to uh, give to the Palestinian citizens of Israel quite uh, a big amount of money through a few years ahead of us for integration and for promoting education, whatever. Uh, then there were ministers who uh, tried to stop it and to avoid the government of doing that. 
So what I think that only a part of this uh, plan was uh, implemented. And anyhow, uh, organizations that we fund, they were the ones who pushed the government to do that. But uh, I'm not sure uh, we succeeded. Uh, anyhow, only partially, I think. So the, the plan is still going on and has certain momentum behind it? I don't know. Uh, we're pushing that uh, by Sikui, which is an organization that is dealing with it, with uh, Jews and Arabs. And uh, it's something that you never know with the government, because they decided to do that. And then some ministers try to avoid it. And then Bibi Netanyahu said we will put a committee to deal with it. And then you didn't hear about that anymore. So, I don't know. And question over here in the front. Yeah. Um, in contrast to the gentleman who spoke before, I think it's reasonable to say that here there are some people who are speaking up. Uh, the growth of J Street is one indication of the number of Congress people who are willing to be identified to some degree with concern for two states. Um, and more recently, there are lots of signs of groups on the ground that no one is really seeing enough of yet. I think you're, it, it would be useful, Talia, if you would say more specifically not just about defending democracy, but about the kinds of groups like Sikui um, that are working now and what they're working on and how they are working to try to educate the population or protect democracy or whatever you want to call it. Well, this is a lot of stuff to, to, to speak about, but uh, I just could uh, say, for instance, people are afraid to go to demonstrations. People from the left, they're afraid to go to demonstrations. So uh, we're funding an organization that is giving legal, uh, uh, legal advice to those people that are getting involved with the police because of going to those uh, demonstrations. We are giving uh, another organization the tools how to make photos and to have evidence of what happened in a demonstration to prove after that in court what happened there to protect those people who took part in their demonstrations. Um, we're giving, uh, well, um, another issue that we're dealing with. Uh, for instance, uh, you know that there was uh, a horrible, horrible, thing that happened that uh, three Jewish people uh, captured a Palestinian boy and uh, uh, burned him to death. Uh, after that, uh, there were a lot of people in Israel that wanted to come to comfort the family. So NIF gave money for five buses, I think, to bring those people to this family, to sit with them to speak to them that there are other Israelis, not this kind of. And uh, I think it was a very good thing to do on that time. For instance, the demonstration against uh, L okay, LGBT, LGBT, yeah. LGBT uh, a year, two years ago, that a girl was uh, murdered in that demonstration in Jerusalem. And the year after that, uh, we funded um, the organization of the uh, demonstration. We brought people by buses to Jerusalem. There was a huge... Uh, the Pride Parade, basically. What? The Pride Parade in Jerusalem. The Pride Parade in Jerusalem. There was a huge demonstration there that we took part in that. We give money to uh, another organization that is called Biyachad, that people, Jewish people and Arab people uh, are standing together hand to hand to show that there is a common 
future for people in Israel, Jewish and Arab citizens. It was a big demonstration in Tel Aviv, we funded it. Well, a lot of things that I can't deal with all of them, but uh, NIF is fund organizations that are relating to uh, the Palestinians out of Israel, for instance, Yesh Din, B'Tselem, uh, breaking the silence, uh, Adala, uh, things like that. And we fund uh, organizations that, for instance, are dealing with women gender. How to, to give more uh, uh, equal status to women in Israel. And we quite uh, succeeded, for instance, in buses. You, you remember that, a few years ago. And we fighted it and uh, brought people to the buses to defend those women, not to let them get to the back of the bus, and things like that. And now in Israel, I think you could see some, it, it's not only co connected only to NIF, but I just wanted to give you a little bit some hope. Don't <laughs> get out from here with a feeling that it is a disaster. Because it is a disaster, <laughs> but we are fighting it. <laughs> we have one one but last I, quick. I just, just wanted to say that, look, you could see a signs of resistance of the people, of large societies of people, that they are starting to feel that something is wrong here is not good for them. For instance, about the media, that Bibi Netanyahu tried to ruin the media, and he didn't succeed totally. Uh, there is uh, in academia that uh, Bennett just said that uh, uh, he is going to uh, apply in universities a ethical code that people won't be able to speak about politics. Now, the Association of Students, they announced him that the minute he would do that, they would burst a strike in all universities in Israel. Uh, there was an uh, attempt in the festival of Akko uh, for, uh, against uh, artists. The, uh, they, uh, how to call that? They wanted to censor uh, uh, basically a play. A play, yes, yeah, that people appeared naked. So the actors canceled the whole festival. They didn't want to come. So there is, you could feel a kind of resistance that is coming, that you could see it now. I can't tell you that it would be a big movement. I don't know what will happen from that, but for me, it's encouraging. Okay, I would love to give more questions. I know many of you wanted to, but I'm, I'm getting signals that we have to, to close. So um, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Talia. Thank you.